I'm a teacher by trade. And I'll begin with an anecdote. When we were growing up in the 60s in West Belfast, 3D films came out and they were all the rage. When you went into the cinema, you were issued with flimsy little plastic glasses. One shiny selfie inside had red and the other had green. And at a signal on the cinema screen, we put the glasses on and we were able to see into the third dimension. At that time, we saw aliens, monsters, creatures from the deep. And I begin with this because I'm very concerned about how we see and understand things. On one level, the flimsy, fancy glasses were about our easily orchestrated childhood feelings. And on another, it was about the entertainment turning a profit and the Broadway cinema sen selling tickets every week. But at a deeper level, the weekly films in the Broadway shaped our understanding of a world peopled by cowboys and Indians, good guys and bad guys, where to our relief, the good guy always white, always won, and always got the girl. Also a white girl. Some of us wanted to be her. Looking back, our understanding of the world we lived in was profoundly shaped by racist and sexist assumptions. But we couldn't see that then. It would take the action, courage, and advocacy of unnamed people to enable us to see what we could not see then, the common humanity and entitlement to rights that belong to everyone, regardless, and I quote, of creed, class, disability, gender, or ethnicity. Those words are taken from page 16 of the agreement, of the 1998 agreement. Now, I'd like you to imagine that those words are like the, the 3D glasses of our cinema youth. Though instead of being able to see hidden monsters, the lens that these words produce enable us to see lives that are marginalized by circumstances named in the legislation, by class, creed, disability, gender, and ethnicity. Hearing these words aloud alerts us to the lives that they capture. They are lives lived in circumstances that might otherwise remain invisible unless named and written into law. The Human Rights Bill that was advised to the Secretary of State 10 years ago names an additional 25 circumstances that require rights protections. They include protections from discrimination for Irish travellers and for people with certain health conditions. We can be sure that behind each circumstance named is a lengthy history of struggle and perhaps of suffering. Having a source of discrimination named in law is an achievement for the people concerned. In this way, our law and ethical sight is sensitized, as it were, to other people's humanity and vulnerability. The 10th anniversary of the Human Rights Bill is uh, to the Secretary, the advice to the Secretary of State is unlikely to be marked by an anniversary, but I hope it is marked in some way that appreciates the milestone achievement it represents for all of us. My contribution this morning arises from equality rights and their impacts on marginalised women's lives. The people who drafted Section 75 of the equality legislation that followed from the agreement changed the wording. They removed class that occurs in page 17 of the agreement, page 16 of the agreement, and replaced it with political opinion. The word creed became religious belief. So political opinion and religious belief became the first two grounds named in the law. Class disappeared. I've often wondered about the difference that might have been made if the change of wording had not happened if we had retained the term class in the legislation. 
The thought occurred to me again when May Blood made her inspirational contribution to the Civil Rights Festival event that celebrated Angus McCormick last month in Belfast. At the time of my escapades in the three, with the 3D glasses in the Broadway, May Blood was living in appalling conditions in a street off the Donegal Road in Belfast. Our house in Ballamurphy, with its indoor toilet and gardens front and rear, would have seemed like luxury to her then. She had worked for women's rights all her life, she said, but she was opposed to women-only committees and trade unions or anywhere else. She didn't support women-only political parties either, even though she chaired the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. She explained why. Gender, she said, is not the issue that matters most. Neither is religion, race, nor other differences between people. The most important issue, May said, challenging everyone present and challenging us today, is the condition and unity of the working class. Once you bring gender, religion, or race into the picture, she said, she argued forcefully, the main political strength of the working class is wrecked by divisiveness. She told of the outbreak of the troubles and of her father defending a Catholic neighbour. Pressure was put on her own family, and in the end they had to move out. She would have loved to have been a part of the civil rights struggle in the 60s, she said, and simply explained it was not to be. She did not need to go further. She was referring, of course, to the fact that a movement for the rights and protections of those most in need of rights and protections was a movement that she couldn't join. In another time and place, it might have been different. Winning the struggle to be named in civil rights law is vital. The implementation of the law and its potential to make a difference often depends on guidance and leadership from institutions that are set up for that purpose. The impact of the equality law on marginalised women's lives is my concern here today. In research I carried out a few years ago, I came across what appeared to be an approach within the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland that viewed the first two grounds in the equality law as divisive for women. The divisiveness of equality may seem like a dubious subject for celebration of civil rights, but please bear with me. The important work of appreciating landmarks, marking achievements, naming people and remembering individuals is also a time to take stock and consider what remains to be done. One of the challenges we face is to depoliticize <coughs> questions of rights and equality so that everyone benefits and everyone sees that they're benefiting. The benefits are there regardless of class, creed, disability, gender or ethnicity. The title of my talk is Women's Lives, Institutional Sciences. Its focus is the lives of marginalised women who are most in need of equality and rights. These women are more likely to be lone parents, to have less disposable incomes, to be less in control of family incomes, and they swell the ranks of the insecure, unofficial labour market. Additionally, consider the local impacts of welfare reform, austerity economics, and Brexit anxieties, and it is clear that conditions for the most marginalised people have worsened. The gap between affluence and poverty here has widened and looks set to deepen. Equality law cannot reverse this, but it can require political public bodies sorry, to pay due regard to the impacts of their policies on the most vulnerable people, whose circumstances are recognised in the legislation. Women's lives are adversely affected by each of the grounds named in the equality law. I'll call out each one and ask you to think of someone who fits each ground that's named. The grounds are religious belief, political opinion, racial group, age, marital status, sexual orientation, gender, disability, 
and people with dependence. If you think of a person with a disability, other equality grounds obviously intersect. The person you may have thought of will be a particular age and gender. They may be married with dependents. They may be Catholic, Hindu, Muslim, or Protestant, and be proud to be a British citizen or an Irish nationalist. If you imagine the equality grounds as a set of avenues, they crisscross at some points in all of our lives. In different ways and at different ages of our lives, each of us will be vulnerable and in need of social supports. All of us need the protection of rights and equality, whether we find ourselves in a nursing home, a courtroom, or a classroom. For instance, it's easy to see that age applies to everyone, but we can appreciate that different life stages call for different social resources. Childcare is needed for young people, for young children rather. Young people need education, and older people sometimes need palliative care. We know these things almost without thinking about them. If we think of men and women at different life stages, it's obvious that childcare is a woman's gender issue because of her role as primary childcare in the family. We know from the research that child poverty is concentrated in specific districts, which means that the effects of poverty are often invisible to the wider community. Child poverty data, however, is like the canary in the coal mine. It calls for action. It is not a threat to the peace, nor does it warn of a return to violence. Dreadful child poverty data is found in deprived regions of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. However, and this hardly needs saying to this audience, the special circumstances and particular needs of the people of Northern Ireland mean that we face challenges that May Blood rightly identified as potentially divisive. By the way, the words the special circumstances and particular needs of the people of Northern Ireland is a quote taken from the 10-year-old Bill of Rights that's been submitted to the Secretary of State 10 years ago. I keep repeating that 10 years because I do think it's very significant that we, that 10 years ago coincides with our anniversary this year. The local child poverty data is a call for action. That's why when I was asked some years ago to write a report on women's poverty in West Belfast, I turned to child poverty data. I could find no research that could enlighten me about women's poverty in West Belfast at the time. I found that 80% of pupils in some schools were receiving free school meals. At the moment, the constituency today reveals that 40% of the children living there live in poverty. In Derry City itself, Goretti Horgan reports that nearly two-thirds of the children live in poverty. And let's pause for a moment and consider that child poverty is not evenly distributed across a city or a constituency, but is concentrated in particular districts and particular lives. This means that in some neighbourhoods, generations of families will have experienced appalling levels of child poverty. The read across to women's equality is obvious. In writing the West Belfast report, I turned to the Equality Commission for information. The institution was set up to oversee and advise government on equality law. At the time of my research, the Commission had prepared a report for the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. It's called CEDAW for short. The report was progressive. It used the Section 75 categories extensively and recommended that further grounds be included, including traveller women and rural women. However, it made no reference to women and the grounds of religion and politics. The first two grounds of the equality legislation were absent in relation to women. The omission, the omission is actually more shocking when you learn, as I did, that the previous UK report to CEDAW prompted concerns from the CEDAW committee about the unemployment differentials between Catholic women and their Protestant sisters to use the CEDAW language. The differential stood at 1.8% at the time. 
This means that Catholic women were almost twice as likely to be unemployed as their Protestant sisters. CEDAW members questioned officials from the Northern Ireland office and received reassurances. However, in the following report, the one that I was reading, the report was silent on differentials. I asked the committee, the commission side, why? And officials said that naming sectarian equalities would be divisive for the women's sector. In a written reply, they stressed that the research wasn't available. I wrote a journal article and used intersectionality to illustrate a similarity in the implementation of civil rights in the United States and equality law in Northern Ireland. In each case, a generation after rights are won, those who were most in need of equality were failed when it came to the implementation. In the US Labour Court, black women who experienced sex and race discrimination had no redress for intersectional discriminations. That has been remedied since. In Northern Ireland, deep-rooted intersectional inequalities experienced by women in the most marginalised districts appear to have disappeared, to have been rendered invisible within the institution that is responsible for oversight and guidance on the implementation of equality law. As I say, I wrote the article for a feminist law journal and moved on. Over the years, I've kept an eye, though, in the, on how the absence of strong leadership has had an influence over a culture of silence that has permeated the discourse on women's equality since then. A few years back, for instance, a groundbreaking report on women's role in the economy in Northern Ireland was published by one of the leading voluntary sector women's organisations. The report repeated the Equality Commission's astounding silence on gender and the first two grounds in the legislation, namely religion and politics. This otherwise pioneering report on women and the economy provides an intersectional approach that combines gender with ethnicity, and gender with disability. It sets out the compound impacts of different inequalities on different gender. <coughs> when I asked the author about the omission of, the omission of religion and politics, she said that she'd taken guidance from her advisory panel. All people who have dedicated their lives to women's equality in Northern Ireland. I didn't contact them. I didn't see the point. I assumed they too thought that reporting differentials would be divisive. Perhaps the necessary research still remains to be done. If so, the Equality Commission has not commissioned it. I've sometimes felt like the kid in the story of the king's new clothes. He points to the king's nakedness, but the cheering onlookers do not want to see, and are shocked and ashamed when they do. The question is, who pays the price of silence? Which lives are rendered invisible if their circumstances remain nameless? There is no doubt that targeting poverty on the basis of objective need is the way to eliminate sectarian differentials. As Inez McCormick used to say, it's need, not creed, that matters. She was surely right. May Blood's contribution to the festival reiterated the necessity to focus on working class issues. However, the policy mechanism for doing this, targeting social need, appears to have been abandoned. Politicising poverty is not the way to go. Perhaps putting the word class back into legislation would work. Some of our leading NGOs have shown us the way. The Participation and Practice of Rights NGO, for instance, is worth checking out on the, the website. They are leading lights in how to tackle inequality. Next, later in this month, actually, they're running um, an event in the shackle called Conscious Cruelty, Social Security, the Economy and Human Rights. But being unable to see women's poverty because women's circumstances are invisible in reports from the body responsible for equality guidance does not make the problem disappear. If we no longer see a problem, if it is no longer named, then our ethical eyesight 
is blocked. We become unable to name it. It is in both cases not seeing and not naming. We do nothing about it. But the problem of community differentials in places like West Belfast is not going away. An outcomes-based strategy to tackle child poverty would make a difference. Targeting social need would make a difference. The full implementation of Section 75 and the allocation of social housing, for instance, would make a difference. Institutions have a responsibility in all of this to all of us. In contrast to the silence on women, and I think not unrelated to it, there is an emerging and highly visible conversation about finding some way to share the island of Ireland as an island of equals within the European Union. It is argued that the economy of both parts of the island will be improved and life will be better for all of us. That may be so. It is certainly a huge claim worth investigation. It is also a profoundly political claim that calls for a civil conversation and dignified debate. The Brexit crisis plus unfulfilled rights commitments agreed to in negotiations allied to reproductive rights and equality, uh, equal marriage rights, recently won in the Republic, <coughs> may go some way to explain the recent surge of interest and anxiety about questions of national sovereignty. Sorry, I'll finish. I'm wrapping up now. I'm getting a sign from the back. I'm sorry if I'm overstaying my welcome. I'll, I'll finish. I'm coming to a close. And I will just close, actually, I'll come off script. I will just close, actually, by recalling something that I've learned in preparation for giving this talk today. And it is that Winston Churchill was involved in the European Convention on Human Rights. He was involved in actually scribing the Universal, the, the UN, the European Convention on Human Rights in 1949. And one of the reasons he was involved in it was because he belonged to a right-wing movement that saw socialism racing through Western democracies and he decided with others that it had to be curbed. And the convention was a way of curbing democratic rights and freedom. And I think that bears remembering when we think of rights always being an advance. I think they significantly are. But the implementation of rights and their impacts on what democratic governments can do is a critical field. For further research, you'd be glad to know. Thank you.